applied to be like our Bitcoin moderator and I was shocked that they said, yeah, sure. And so, yeah, I became like an our Bitcoin moderator on Reddit 2014. Do you have any like personal highlights in the community that you like, oh, this, this time, like maybe 2017 with the block says wars or like 2020 when Michael Saylor came in, like, is there any like, um, point that you point to that's like, was a really highlight for you in the Bitcoin community till now? Yeah, I guess maybe 2000 and like early 2014, I suppose. Um, that's when I was, um, like I applied to be like a, our Bitcoin moderator and I was shocked, but they said, yeah, sure. And so yeah, I became like an, our Bitcoin moderator on Reddit, uh, 2014. Oh, so like on, on the subreddit of, uh, Bitcoin, uh, you, you've been a moderator. Oh, how's that? I heard a lot about the 2017 time. So have you been a moderator since through ever since? Yeah, it is. Right. How was the, uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about the 2017 time? I heard it was pretty hilarious, uh, and pretty, um, hard to understand, like the different sides coming into Bitcoin and, and doing all the stuff is the, uh, was that also for you? Yeah. Uh, no, I always say it was really too difficult. Uh, it's kind of funny you bring that up. I, I would say like, for me, it was like 2015 and 2016 were kind of a bit more trying, uh, specifically like in that area, like within kind of Reddit and Reddit moderation and subreddits. And the reason why was because like, there was like a common narrative of, you know, <laughs> you guys are guilt keepers for promotion and you're trying to basically censor people from wanting to have healthy discourse about block sizes because we should raise the block size. It's obvious we need to raise the block size so that everybody can have scalability and transactions and cheaper fees. And it's clearly the best solution. And like, that's, you know, that, that was what we were getting like constantly, right? Like from a lot of angles and the thing is it, it wasn't clear if it's like, this is a few different concentrated people that are just sibling us with like our race, or is it that it's in effect a larger community effort of wanting to like add this narrative of, yeah, we need to raise the blocks so that we can have cheaper fees, so that we can have, you know, copies for Bitcoin all day on chain. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was a trying time. And so I remember what happened was like kind of early on, like we got rallied by a specific moderator. We just said, Hey, we should, uh, kind of allow this course to happen like in the daily, you know, discussions, but don't make it contentious and, you know, remove that, like get rid of it. Like it's just, it's noise. And at first I was a little bit of disagreement with that about it, but during like kind of talking to him back and forth and, we're, and talking with the other moderators back and forth. I realized that, yeah, it makes sense because like it says we're individuals just volunteering doing our thing and like we were not the most educated to say this is what should be done or that's what should be done. But we do see that when we go through like a quick knee-jerk reactionary maneuver, you have like unforeseen consequences that well, we can't be a sir like no of or be assured of and so that really kind of had you know us like i said removing threads about contention and pretty much the uh your economists like you know are we're, we're uh you know we're north korea here like and we were batting all like dissenting opinions right and it's like not really what we it's like uh we could you could look at kind of i was very often a lot of us very often about you know you were over the daily discussion like you go ahead and talk about it there and then it's like uh, on top of it we um we had, you know, like this sort of emergence of like RBTC, like kind of taking over and eclipsing our butt coin, kind of being the whole, you know, a little adversary kind of uh, trying to do like a reasoned contra argument. And a lot of people were reasoned with their contra arguments. And I was like, great with that, you know, and um, that was fine. And that, that was awesome. That was great discourse, you know. Um, because I really feel like the girl here is we need to like have the average intelligence and the average, uh, you know, information of what was happening with raising the block size or with kind of the approaches of scalability, like to the forefront, if the average, you know, information about it was, you know, more improved then we could be able to carry forward, like your other proposed solutions, like ultimately um that you know we were thinking about for scalability um but let's kind of give a little bit of background to that like i'll just kind of give you like my what i remembered about it right so what i recall was uh gavin and Dreeson 
talking about in this, I believe this would have been about 2014 because we were already kind of going through the whole, you know, bear market of 13 and then kind of reeling back down. It was kind of like, hey guys, like you guys should know, it's like we do need to increase the block size, otherwise we're going to run into problems with uh, having scalability and trying to compete with Visa. And so I proposed Bitcoin XT, which was just like a modest two megabyte, you know, block size increase. And when that happened, I mean, I remember a lot of people kind of being up in arms about it, and other people, like I said, like being going home for it and going for and promoting it. I feel like. Roger Ver was kind of in that cap and kind of with them. And this was also bolstered by uh, by Mike Kern as well. And so you had these big prominent like people in Bitcoin who were, you know, like deified at that point because they were, you know, the, the bringers of the software, like Gavin Andreessen was the, the, the lead scientist and maintainer of the Bitcoin, you know, reference client at the time. And then you had Mike Kern, who was on who was the, the guy behind Bitcoin Joe, Bitcoin Java. And that's pretty much where it was used for all of the SPV wallets, which, you know, at that point in 2013, you were using one of his derivative wallets. If it wasn't one of his wallets, then it was one of Andreas Schoenbach's wallets, which was the classic Bitcoin wallet. And uh, even that was still using Bitcoin J. And so, like, these were big people when you think about it, right? Um, like, they did have, like, experience um, and were, con- were considered, like, more respected, like, I would say even more so than like Rook and CK, right? Um, who were doing like the, the mining software that everybody was using. It's kind of wild when you think about it, right? Uh, so that happened. And then I recall from there, kind of uh, my career not really kind of getting his work XT. Like, like people were kind of not really going with it. And so, like, uh, he sort of did the Roach Prep thing. And then I remembered. Uh, the reason why Gavin Andreessen kind of phased out was because he got played by Craig Wright, right? Like, uh, and so that, that happened there. So anyhow, those things happened. And then, um, it kind of morphed from being a narrative about Bitcoin, uh, XT to being about, uh, Bitcoin cash and the difference with, uh, and Bitcoin cash was Roger Bear's thing. Right. And so that was, uh, 2016, I think. And so, uh, or it might have been the end of two. Th- yeah, I think it would have been 2016, kind of 2017, because the whole little split happened, and there was like a quick run up when that split happened, and it wasn't really a split so much as it was an airdrop. Um, okay, we're here, coming back. Yeah, it wasn't so much a split as it was an airdrop, and so when that happened, um, ultimately, yeah, like the the world kind of went nuts with it, and was like some people cashed out, and some people were like, this is going to be the next Bitcoin. And so, um, that happened and it kind of gained a bit of traction, but then it fizzled out, um, where it really fizzled out, but it was gaining traction. But at the same time you had, uh, I believe it was, if it wasn't Jian Wu, it was the, yeah, I think it was Jian Wu who was promoting Bitcoin ABC, right? Which, um, was yet another fork. And this was kind of, I believe ABC was, uh, from the perspective that, you know, we need to put control for the miners because the miners are the ones behind validating and pushing transactions for it. Um, and, you know, obviously the thing is that Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is kind of, it's as much a technology as it's a social experiment, right? Because it's a social experiment and seeing how game theory will play out if humans will actually follow game theory or not. Um, because what happened was you have all these different participants. A lot of them have skin in the game, but a lot of them don't. Um, you'd have skin in the game by having a bunch of coins help, um, or by working on development of the protocol or working on development of derivative software that follows the protocol. Right. And so all these people, that's how you explain why my curl felt like, yeah, like what he had to say was important. Like he had the skin in the game to be able to say, yeah, this is my reputation. It's what I brought to the table. Same with, you know, uh, Gavin and Dreesen. And then if you want to go further, we can even talk about like loop dash junior, or we could talk about, um, the guy from uh, uh, BitPay, uh, I'm gonna remember it later. Basically, these folks all came up with like derivative ways of using a reference protocol. And the thing is, now this stuff really kind of gains traction because the 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 issue is that at the end of the day, people do something because there's an incentive to do it. And Bitcoiners aren't stupid. Bitcoiners find what is the hidden incentive for doing what you're doing. And once that's found out, you see that it's not, it's not 
from a place of gen- it's not a genuine place. Like it's not actually a place to try to improve things. It's a place to improve your hand or improve your standing in, in to gain. Um, in a sense, that's why people don't like. Um, that's why a lot of people don't like Adam Back and Gray Maxwell, right? Because Blockstream and Liquid, and the fact that they are utilizing and use Tether to, you know, be able to, um, be able to, you know, with this trust, have a different like flow money that's not blocked by sanctions or by Visa, right? <laughs> and so, um, and as well, I said, as far as Marie, it's like. That kind of leads to this whole idea of like Justin Sun, I think his name with Tron, right? Kind of acting as a competitor for that, right? And in our sense, it's like these things kind of give credence and validity to altcoins, which is kind of like, Ugh, it's gross. If you're trying to be a, a maximalist, or if you've gone through this evolution of discovering Bitcoin, discovering altcoins, trying altcoins, getting burned on altcoins, and just trying to be a purist and staying into Bitcoin because you just see that Bitcoin is a tool to opt out. Right. And so if that happens and I do that path you go through, you then have this incentive to not want to see Bitcoin change or not want to see stupid mistakes happen to destroy what we have. And so because of that, that's how you explain how people with a lot of skin in the game or people with no skin in the game who are just kind of maybe have, you know, maybe your 90 million Satoshi, right? Maybe that's all I got, but to them, that's for life savings. Right. Uh, that's how I explain why these different diverse perspectives happen. And because of these diverse perspectives, you're going to have the warring and infighting, and it's going to be slow to evolve, uh, to evolve and slow to change. And I think that is the correct path because uh, the slow to evolve and change will ensure that you will have resiliency until a point is necessary where things are broken. And if things are broken, then you will fix or you will have already had the time to plan those solutions, or the solutions have already occurred. And you can just have kind of a drop and fit kind of with the substitutes. I mean, in a way, you could kind of see that's what happened with our decision with Luke Dash Jr. And I believe it was, uh, I forget the guy's name. I think it's Peter DeWill, uh, his decision to kind of soft fork Segwit, right? And so, um, yeah, like that was kind of what happened. And we mentioned 2017 is an exciting time because ultimately, that, yeah, that's kind of also when the users felt like they could put it in their hands. And, um, you know, do the user activated software, right? The UAS app, right? And so, um, yeah, that was kind of the, all right, guys, we need to see this happen because if that doesn't happen, you know, shit's going to go bad. We don't care. We're going to fork the network. We're going to make it happen, right? And I, I see kind of like that was sort of the, I, you know, that was a different, it was just another person's like desire and, you know, desire for a way to have an outcome by trying to force the outcome. And I think they got lucky that, you know, there was just enough inertia that nobody really kind of carried because in essence, like that could have been a bad moment to where we would have had like a Bitcoin versus a Bitcoin classic, you know? <laughs> um, so that's kind of how I see uh, that, that past in that history. Um, like I said, around 2015, it really felt, and 2016, it felt a little stressful because it kind of felt like an us versus like us moderators versus everybody who was just kind of like, we're about freedom and we try to be maximalist. And so we should discuss and we don't care if, you know, this is what you have to say. Right. And it's like, but you're being foolhardy about it. And you know, this is, I'm sure trying to show you how this is how you're worried about it. And it seemed like, yeah, about 2017 with kind of the USF, like everybody kind of saw, yeah, we can't just do bigger blocks like that because it's a shotgun approach and trying to kind of go for the quick and easy dirty solution. You're going to have a situation where you're going to need to have class prohibitive hardware, like over time, as you're trying to have the same sort of transaction reliability, if you're doing the bigger blocks. Do you feel that in, uh, the, the discourse and uh, the discussions now are more mature, or like in a, in a, in a different state? I mean, the, since 2014, 15, Bitcoin has evolved a lot. Like we have now, uh, public companies in there. We have the Bitcoin ETF. Like we have a lot of um, more capital, more people in there, more institutional investors. Uh, probably, I was not around 2015. I was coming into a community slowly in 2017, but really in 2020. Uh, I imagine that this course and the community was really, really different. How did this 
evolve over time? Like how, how different was it 2015 to compared to now? Yeah, I mean, in 2015, people still thought, you know, that it's still a risk. It's still highly experimental. Like there's, we don't know that it's going to be here to stay. Um, well, like it felt like that in 2013 when I just got started, but uh, like for me, uh, and yeah, like, but at the same time, um, we had this thing where it was like, you know, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cleared a thousand bucks. It was 1200 bucks in November of 2013. And so we were just like, yeah, this is it. This is the future. I remember like that happening and like six months before I was just getting into Bitcoin thinking, man, I wish it would reach $10,000 one day. That would be so incredible. You know, like that's where I was at. Um, and, uh, yeah, like it just kind of did this look meteor presence because that happened. Like, I was like, wow, this is going to be, it was like life changing forever. Like, you know, the, it happened in December, 2013, I booked tickets to go to Miami to the conference in, in January. Right. Cause I was like, it's it. We're, we're done. And then I quit my job, but I tried to, you know, Troy, you know, that was, uh, yeah, and I tried to show it in mind full time and that didn't work. Right. So, uh, yeah, like it was a different time. So around 2000 and. 15, 2016, it was a little hairy because you were a very block size kind of thing. And then I think once the scale of Bitcoin conference happened in December 2015, and Peter and uh, Luke pretty much announced their little soft fork thing, like it was like epic mic drop. We were all like, wow, oh, this is the shit. Like everybody was in use. And they, yeah, that's that's a solution. That's a great way. Because um, with the soft fork, you are able to stir like, Keep your old software and it still runs. And then the newer software just kind of hops in. And the whole point is, um, your game theory, it should be incentivized for you to where you are going to be able to, you know, like, um, want to switch over because it'll be cheaper fees or you get better transaction, transaction throughput. Something interesting to you that I kind of think about, um, that around that time, like 2015, 2016, Lightning was, uh, was definitely like, uh, um, an experiment, like a much, like much more of an experiment. I remember, uh, like roast beef and rusty Russell kind of did their stuff that, um, I believe roast beef, uh, did the, um, you know, an impl the clear implementation. Right. And then, uh, or I might be wrong, but pretty much, yeah, like it was just kind of experimental software and it was kind of not clear at how it worked. Um, but it was interesting, you know, and, um, kind of now we've hit this point to where it evolved, but it stagnated. And, um, we tried to have like learner barriers for everybody kind of use lightning, but I see that like the geopolitical environment has like made it hostile to even like touch. Um, and that's why you have like onboarders who were there to try to make the experience easier. They're kind of like taking flight because like to learn, they don't see the, the worth, the worth it is for the regulatory risk to have to, try to hold a reserve or try to have accountability for KYC AML when the whole point is that you're not supposed to aim AML KYC these things you should just spin as you see fit mm, I love it uh, and it's 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 fascinating for me how this this uh, space evolved like uh, when you compare it like how how hard it was at some point to buy even Bitcoin uh, and now it gets easier and easier to buy it it gets easier and easier to spend it it's It'd be interesting to see where we are in, in like 10 years with more money coming in, more companies coming in, more interests coming in, and more technology uh, advancement in the ecosystem around Bitcoin. Uh, so, around the core, so. I don't wanna, I want to counter kind of what you're saying. Like, um, so I would say it, you know, you're right. It has been kind of like, it was hard to acquire Bitcoin, but it was like, it was weird. Like, it was hard to acquire Bitcoin before I got in. Uh, when I got in, it was actually kind of easy. It's like Luna, March 2013, it was kind of easy. Um, and I'd say conversely, you could actually spin Bitcoin in a lot more cases in the past versus now. It seems like it's much harder really. Like you, you were thinking you should be able to be ubiquitous, but it, it seems less ubiquitous. Like really, the Renaissance was 2013 when, when you had Microsoft and Overstock and Expedia doing their thing, right? Like, uh, Expedia was doing their thing, but I found something called Cheap Air, and that's how I bought plane tickets for Bitcoin. I, I that seemed awesome to me. And then you had uh, Vinny Langan who had this, uh, he had this like gift card. I forget what it's called, but, uh, he had like a gift card kind of exchange thing where you could buy the digital gift cards for the Bitcoin. And like, I was using that to live off Bitcoin in 2014 for a bit. Right. And so, um, a lot of those things are gone. Um, 
like I bought an Xbox for three quarters of a Bitcoin, right? Because there was such a sweet deal. It was like 180 bucks at the time and had like, you know, a whole year of like Xbox Live and stuff, right? But to me, like that, I valued that because I loved video games and like my income is only Bitcoin. So it worked for me. Uh, but that's gone. I don't think you can buy things on Newegg anymore with Bitcoin, right? Um, that's really interesting. And uh, it, it might be because it was a new thing and people were testing it out and then like, oh, okay, Bitcoin is not ready for it to being a, a medium of exchange yet. And I, I feel like it is not really ready for mass mass adoption. Like I think like uh, the, the question of like, oh, when the fiat system actually fails like in two years, and Bitcoin should actually replace it in two years. I feel like we're, we're not there yet. Like it, it needs a little, uh, we, we need definitely need more time to uh, do that. Uh, do you agree? Uh, yeah, but the thing is like, I don't know, I've grown with Bitcoin and like since, you know, 2013. And well, like, I don't think the fiat system fails like, you know, like we're saying, like it's not a fantastic or spectacular thing. It's It's like a slow kind of max pain thing where everybody does exactly what they can to try to keep things going as long as they can. Because there's still a lot of people that are succeeding and thriving through the fiat system and through the inefficiencies it brings. And so those people will will die for, you know, keeping that system the way it is because that was their nut. You know, that's how they made what they had. Um, And so, yeah, like there's going to, I think there's going to, the situation is going to be kind of a, a terror with two systems where the two systems will continue to thrive. And there's going to be a point to where hopefully a critical mass happens and more and more people kind of do this. Uh, I think it's called quad four, you know, maneuver where more and more of the, the value from the one chain go, which is, you know, the classical assets and equities goes into just holding Bitcoin and Bitcoin derivatives. I think the problem with uh, this though is that Bitcoin is ultimately seen as a storage of value and it's not necessarily seen as a method as a method and mechanisms of transacting. It's not seen as cashing. And that's kind of, I think, what Roger Ver is this whole like, you know, argument is based on is going for and why he believes that Bitcoin cash is the Bitcoin and is that it's the, the digital cash. However, I have another theory. I think that Satoshi Nakamoto opted out and left Bitcoin because he saw that human beings are inherently, you know, flawed in that this technology is also a still a social experiment in that we fail right because we're caught in the minutia of how can i bring my own position forward rather than how can we all survive together and thrive and um, i i can see that that that's kind of the way it will happen though because what i've said how can how can we all work together and thrive it's fundamentally attendant to communism right like and socialism and the thing is the problem with communism and socialism that i think the world needs to understand is that on paper it's great but the reason why it doesn't work is because you're always going to have the agency problem you're always going to have people at the top or people that have insider information or privileged information they're going to use it to exploit everyone else and so everyone else in aggregate loses because you have cheaters and that's that's human nature and so that right there like is i mean that's that you know so um how do we how do you grow move along beyond that right and that's why i said it was like a, it's kind of like a human behavior and human you know human problem not necessarily and that because of that like no technology can solve that like no ai is going to solve that no cash or no law no votes going to solve that right. i think the only thing that solves things like that is max pain like people throwing great suffering and feeling like they need to collectively come together. And that's the reason why I have like independence day movies and like Armageddon movies and like disease and alien movies. That's the reason why people rock behind them because it's so like wildly, like, you know, so fairy tale like, but it seems like, yeah, I would band a little together with my enemy to, to, you know, to be able to survive. Right. And so that that's what humans want, right? We want to be able to stir like rest, seeding, flourishing. But it's like funny because we make up enemies and we make up bad guys, but the realities were all bad guys. Like everybody is the actual bad guy. And the realty is no good guy because we're based on this whole like selfish interest thing. That's uh, that's a fascinating thought uh, to think about. 
um, what you said earlier about communism, I'm 100% agreeing with you. Like this is uh, totally the case, and I hope so that we come to the state where we all kind of agree that we cannot all thrive like that. Uh, there will be people that thrive more, and there will be people that thrive less, just because of like even if you uh, level out the capital for every human, but every human has a human capital, like how he thinks, yeah. what he does, like what what his brain is all about. And you can, uh, and, and I'm a deeply a believer that someone that was poor from poor family and got rich because he worked hard and he was disciplined, you can take all his money and he will work his uh, butt off and will be in like five, 10 years at the same point than he was before because he knows how to uh, get it. And if you take a, a poor person uh, and give them a bunch of money, they will lose it again. Uh, this is the, the same thing that happens with all the lottery winners. Like we have great studies about the lottery winners. When they win it, they give the money out and they probably have in one, two years less than before. Because they spend it all. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and so it's like, even if we level out the capital, there's still the human brain involved. And so for me, Bitcoin is just uh, a more fair system where when you have Bitcoin as a fundamental base layer of, of our monetary system, uh, you can you have the chance to save in something sound. And so you can focus on what you're good at. But if you're not doing anything, like <laughs> it's like I make the, the comparison between uh, if, if you're running on a fiat system, you're running in like a, a sand where there's a lot of water, like you have to dread a lot, you have to really uh, work hard to get ahead. And in, 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 in Bitcoin, it's just like a foundation where you can run on a solid street. You still have to run. Like if you don't run on Bitcoin, like you also don't get anything. Like Bitcoin is proof of work. You have to put in something to get something out. And uh, this is the fundamental thing. And I, and I hope that Bitcoin enables a world where um, people that work hard are rewarded the most and, 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 and not the rent seekers as we have it now in the, in the fiat system. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, but how could, I mean, how could that happen though? Like I said, cause it's still based on a like human desire to want to be equitable or human desire to want to spin your Bitcoin to like, see, you know, some sort of growth or see that those actual gain or benefit from doing that versus taking out a loan and using the loan to, you know, get your, your thing going. Right. Um, so, yeah. and so, yeah, I, I think because of that, like it ultimately kind of fails, but then like how you running a cash system, you want a cash system, like for everybody across the world, does it actually, it doesn't fit for those, like, like I'm in America, right? It doesn't fit for me because right now, like my country is like, my country is leading export is inflation, right? It's because everybody else in the world uses my currency. And so you are going to go ahead and use my thing. I don't have an incentive to switch to something better or different. Like, like, um, I would imagine fundamentally something from Sweden or Switzerland or Iceland would be like I consider it a stronger currency based on the fundamentals and the fact that there's not things like, you know, there's not people or forces that pro that are trying to probe more of it or utilize more of it to, you know, to, to whatever end. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, excuse me. I think I was, uh, I was talking to like a loved one earlier and, um, it was that like the, you can't, you can't like look at these different places or different countries. Like, uh, like, oh, it's better. And the, the reason why is because everybody is unique. Like, every different situation is unique. Um, like, things may be great in in Switzerland, but they don't have to worry about the scalability issues and the the, 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 the level of people in poverty and the level in, 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 who are not educated and level of people homeless that maybe Americans do and America has. And they don't maybe have the same number of cities or different governments to have to deal with like that America has. And so because of those things, it's like, the different countries and nations, they have their own kind of unique, distinctive problems. They can, we can kind of try to compare it, but it's more like apples to oranges in a way because there's also different uh, accepted cultural norms. And it's like, like I tell you right now, like if you were trying to be a middle management in Japan and you've been in America your whole life, you better be working your ass off and actually like trying to work 10 times harder than you did in America because you're not going to milk it in Japan, right? It's just those, like there's like a cultural separation, right? And so, like, yeah, that, that is something I think that, uh, I think that's beautiful and great. And I think that, uh, trying to kind of homogenize that, like is, is a mistake. And so when you think about it, like 
saying that Bitcoin will be the reserve currency and will take over and be the standard does that. <laughs> and so that's why I say again, like it's going to be a situation where Bitcoin is just going to curve this with the other things. I don't think it's a situation where gold dies off or where like currency dies off like so suddenly. For that to happen, you have to have other geopolitical uh, stressors in play like wars and like nuclear wars and like the inability to be able to transact in kind of regular way. And you have to think about it. At that point, it's not Bitcoin anymore, man. I mean, I'm, I'll be real. It's not Bitcoin. It's water and it's medicine and it's food. And so you're not going to take the time to, oh, I need to keep the power so I can keep my nerve going so I can have my things things so I can go to the radio tower and we can mess it in and then I can transact. Fuck that. You're going to be spinning bird and burlets and tampons and maybe some herbs, right? Maybe some cannabis. I mean, like, let's, let's be pragmatic here. And so, um, like Bitcoin is a solution that only works so long as the other systems remain inefficient and continue to succeed. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy bitcoin it's simple have a bitcoin only exchange don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that be on a bitcoin only exchange i use 21 bitcoin 21 bitcoin is for me the best partner for that and now where do you store bitcoin bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet so that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. But before we get to some other topics that I really want to get into, like uh, YouTube, a 3D printer and stuff like that, um, what is like the most exciting or and the most unexciting part of, of, of Bitcoin for you? Like what is uh, the, the thing that you're really excited about inside of Bitcoin? Because it's always interesting to because I speak with so many different Bitcoiners uh, and Bitcoiners have so many different reasons why they're in Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so, like, what's the most exciting po part for you, and like, what's the most uninteresting point in in Bitcoin? The most uninteresting thing in Bitcoin is the price. Absolutely, the price. Fuck the price. If you're looking at the price of Bitcoin, you're short Bitcoin. That's what it is. Like, you just need to you see it, you understand that it is a mechanism for opting out of uh, the the current fiat system, and so you are you are voting by opting out. That's it. And that is it. You will then continue to increase your position. You will spend the Bitcoin when you find something that will make you truly happy from spending it. Like if you feel like putting a greater portion of a down payment on a house is the way, that is how you will spend the Bitcoin. You won't care whether it's a $10 million house one day because it doesn't matter. It makes you happy. Fuck them. Like you'll, you thrive from telling them how much Bitcoin you spent on it. Like I, I love my, I love my Xbox one. I don't even play it anymore. I spent three quarters of a Bitcoin on it, but I don't give a shit. Like, it was great, you know? Like, I played Fallout 4 on it, like, a couple months in when I had no job. And it was so, I was so, it was so irresponsible to do, but we didn't care. Like, I I cherished every moment playing that game. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I fucking loved it. And it was it was a wonderful time and experience. Uh, so, yeah, price is the most unimportant thing, the most uninteresting. The most interesting thing to me is um, the children, the kids. I, I, I'm, I'm so... I, I love this narrative. I I love I love that Luca is here. That Becca had Luca. You know, I love that. Uh, you know, they're from uh, the Moon Factory, right? Uh, Bitcoin Becca. She just like had a baby. Um, I love that. You know, all Bitcoiners are like having having children, 
and that we were having, you know, we're working hard. That's the proof of work, trying to have children to be able to, you know, spread and have them grow. And the, the beauty of Bitcoin is Bitcoin is like the Dumbo feather, right? Like you realize you don't, uh, Parman said something a couple of days ago, I, you know, rock on Twitter, Parm, the Parman. Uh, yeah, he said something on Twitter that, you know, I resonate with. He said, yeah, like it's like a Dumbo feather, you know, you realize you don't, I mean, he didn't say Dumbo, but he's like, you don't really need Bitcoin. Like where you realize where it is, you don't need it. It's like, yeah, that's totally right. You don't need Bitcoin. Bitcoin comes to you because you put in proof of work. Bitcoin shows you that you need to be resilient in your, you know, what you want to do and work on and work towards. You know, maybe it's just drawing, maybe it's just writing your story, but actually putting the desire and commitment to making it happen, like pouring a love into it, um, pouring that love and work in, it just gets reflected out and people eat that up because that's what they want, because they can thrive from just being able to experience like what you have, you know, like I get compliments all the time about kind of the content that I do. And I wonder, like, I don't know, I'm just speaking my mind, like, you were saying you record this. I'd tell you, like, conversely, I do shorts and live all the time. I um, I found that I, I, I don't really care for video editing. I don't care, but it's just like a kind of a blog. Like, I know there's going to be circumstances where, like I said, I have a 4K camera. There's going to be circumstances where I'm still going to do it. But, I, yeah, like, um, yeah, like, I love seeing kind of the perspectives in the future of the children that we're making. And um, I believe that that love will continue to carry out. And we will have someone someday that will build something that will bridge the divides together. And I think maybe that's kind of what we would like to see. We would like to see Bitcoin become a great equalizer towards access and opportunity, access to opportunities, right? Like that maybe more people can be employed somehow through Bitcoin or, you know, we can have things done in such a way to where, you know, you, um, you have a better access to like healthcare or better access to technology because of the proximity to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin powers all these things. And just by being aware of it, you can build bridges that people who don't care about Bitcoin or have no desire to use Bitcoin have desire to use this product, which is powered by Bitcoin. Right. Um, and that, that is what will happen as long as we continue to, you know, build love into the children that we make and teach them about the importance of work and the proof of work and to only spend the Bitcoin on situations and circumstances that make them truly happy. That's a thing. The most beautiful answer to, to that question that someone can, up, can come up with. Uh, really, really cool. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you also mentioned that uh, you're doing YouTube. But what are you doing on, on, on YouTube? Like, what are, what are you sharing there? Holy shit. I don't know, man. Uh, sorry. I didn't mean to curse. I uh, have, yeah, like, all kinds of stuff like um so i have this computer right here that you know i named him timmy right because that is the name of the computer um i got it from a bitcoin miner right this was a bitcoin mining computer has like three gpus in it but um i live streamed from it i uh right i would live stream from my garage um i yeah like if it wasn't going to be here right now i was actually going to be in the garage on uh, a live stream because i need to produce some music right because i'd like to make some beats that i'm going to be using for like my marketing commercial right that I have because I'm, you know, selling CBD gummies for Bitcoin, weed for Bitcoin, right? That's, that's what I do. Um, and so, yeah, like I like to talk about kind of things on that, like on YouTube. Uh, and I also live stream as well, the games. Uh, and so I'm trying to become a professional Fortnite player. Um, I know I'm kind of learning, you know, kind of in my chat, I'm bringing mirth and names. Uh, the average people I'm going to race with is like 10 and 12 year old. It's kind of wild. But yeah, like I, I was streaming that on YouTube. I get all sorts of people all the time. I got to say, the last person I saw, and I can give his name, but basically he saw me in the chat and he was like, we should, we should run be run. I was like, okay, you got it. Let's do it. And so then he's like, he gives me his username. I get his username. I basically, I would jump in and I'm like, he's like, I'm in the match. I'm like, cool. I'll see what you're doing. Right. And this kid was like maybe 10 or 11 years old. And I swear to you, he's the most, he like the most master for like, you know, gamer in Fortnite I've ever seen. Like, incredible, you know, like exceptionally good. And he's just like, yeah, let's play it. I was just like, well, I have something to show. I was like, holy shit, I would, I would be honored to play with you, man. Like, you are a pro. You will show me the way, dude. Let's play. You know, like, play. And so like, that was amazing. Like, that world of action was like, like, awesome. Like, I, 
And I would, I would do anything to have more of those. If I could have that every single day, or another one kid's like, yeah, let me challenge you. And I'm like, okay. And I watched it, and I found out, holy shit, this is the best person I've ever seen play this game ever. And I'm watching all sorts of people play. And when I was a couple of you know, weeks that I played the game, like, yeah, I'm going to like, those kind of experiences are wonderful. And so, uh, yeah, I have a bigger plan to get an anti casting going. I'm going to probably pick up a Streamlabs account so I can uh, do Twitter and, you know, Twitch and YouTube kind of all simultaneously. Uh, that would probably work for the gaming stuff, but for like the garage, I mainly do uh, 3D printing stuff um, and, and gun stuff. But I have to tell the Microsoft replicas on YouTube so my account doesn't get banned. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. I just crossed 500 subscribers. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, if you were watching this in this podcast, my name is Frank and Mint, right? F R A N K E N M I N T. That's me on YouTube. That's me on Twitter. That's me on Reddit. That's me on Bitcoin Talk. Like you can find me anywhere. I uh, I do believe in uh, anonymity, like because of Bitcoin. But at the same time, I love the idea of like even though it's anonymous, I'm consistently the same guy. Like I don't like the idea of sibling and so uh, of having like a bunch of accounts. And so yeah, like I'm gonna be Frank and Mint everywhere. So, I love it, and I will uh, put your your uh, links in the description so people can just like uh, get, go there and 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 go directly to to your YouTube page, uh, Twitter, whatever, uh, and 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 find you directly there. It's uh, really really cool. And congratulations on the first five hundred. I, I I know how how hard of a struggle <laughs> it is. Like I I the, the first time I tried YouTube, it was like three years ago. Uh, I really struggled hard and got from zero to 200 in like a year, <laughs> something like yeah. that. I was really bad also. Uh, then I tried again now in December. Uh, I got one month and got like five subscribers, more like 205 or something like that in, in January. And then I kind of figured it out how it's working. And I'm now really close to the 4,000 subscribers. Uh, so wow. this was like uh, a really, awesome. that, that was like really... All of a sudden, when you, you figure out how it, how it's working and, and people like your stuff and people recommend to other people's uh, stuff. And the, the most amazing thing for me is always when someone goes ahead and clips one of my clips, one of my videos, and puts it on Twitter with my original link in there and tags me. I'm like, what? Oh, uh, that's people, people go yeah, to, that's the struggle, yeah. to the struggle and clip it. And, and I always repost and, and advertise for them the, the shit out because I, I really appreciate that work and appreciate that you got so much uh, value out to do that. So I'm, 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 I'm bumped that I'm, I'm, I'm already here, but uh, I, I know how hard it is to go anywhere uh, on, on, on YouTube. YouTube is a really hard platform to grow, honestly. Twitter, I feel like was easier. It, it's a little bit more viral. You can connect easier. Uh, but YouTube, at least for me, it was the hardest platform, honestly, till now. And yeah, uh, uh, really, really cool that uh, that you are here, and and, uh, and I encourage everybody to to check your stuff out. And and I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to, to to see more of you and seeing live streams of you. Uh, really cool. And Thank you're you. doing three uh, D printing. Uh, what, what what are you doing there? Uh, a lot. Uh, you know, I'll be right back. I'll show you some. All right, I'm back. So here we go. This is a uh, this is an Excalibur Sonic that I've. Uh, Critic recently, it's oh, it's like color, nice. Yeah, it's, um, I it's yeah. golden, right? It's a golden color. Yeah, it's a gold. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the equivalent Super Sonic, right? Uh, from Sonic in the Black Knight. It's a game that came out on Wii, I think uh, mid two thousand tens or something like that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I printed this kind of in one go on a um, Bamboo Labs uh, X one C. I printed it upside down to try to kind of have the the bulk of the mask kind of this way, and then I just had a bunch of spurts. And then, yeah, like it's it's multi-colored. Um, it was done with a matter, and so you can kind of see me right here. I had to kind of fix his butt with some blue because uh, this wasn't done like with an STL model. This was done with like a Blender model. So there was a whole bunch of furrows and gaps in here, like because that's what he would. They probably they like, ripped this directly from like video game assets, and so uh, you know that's kind of. Uh, what that was, but this is kind of the last thing my program I was pretty proud of. Uh, we said we should talk about that. Uh, so what happened was in 2012, I um I was a workaholic and I wasn't taking care of my health, 
and I got infection and I got um, sepsy. I got sepsis, right? And so I was in the hospital for like two weeks, right? Like half a month. And I had like surgeries like every day to like, you know, basically, you know, cure it off. Like they simply just, you know, the bad flesh, right? Like pretty much have surgeries to like recoup. And so, um, yeah, like I was given a prognosis of like 20%. Like, like, yeah, there was 80% chance you're going to die, dude. And so I had, you know, up, you know, we were alive after all that. I was like, so I was like, for all the ride. We were up your eyes to like, you don't want to be a work of art anymore after that. You really want to live your life and love you for you so that you have every money you can have, right? So yeah, don't be a workaholic. Just just from that, if if I if I can teach you to not be a workaholic from that, my my mission has been accomplished as a person in life, and I'm I'm happy and satisfied from just that. And there's the right, so. yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> like yeah, one thing I, I want to add to that. Like there's this concept of ikigai. You probably heard of it. Uh, and there's, the, the, there's like half ikigai and full ikigai and uh, and there's like this full concept in inside of ikigai there's the thing do what you love do what you are good at uh, do what the world needs and do what you will get rewarded for and uh, the first two things are really important to find the second two things like if you find something that you're really good at and you really love it uh, then you kind of f figure out a, a way how this could actually uh, contribute a really good thing for the world uh, and then you actually get also rewarded for that like if you find something that uh, you are, you love and you're really good at it and the world needs it you will get rewarded for that and then you like don't work anything because you just do what you love like you you stand up and 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 you you do what uh, you love it's kind of like my situation right now with with, uh, with YouTube because I'm doing it full time now, podcasting, YouTube and all this stuff. There's little amounts of work I have to do that I don't want to do. It's like, for example, filing taxes and stuff like that. I, I really don't want to do that, but it's like kind of necessary to do the rest of the thing. Uh, so when I define work as something I don't really want to do, but I have to do it, uh, then I'm working maybe like five to 10 hours a week uh, for things that I have to do, but I don't want to do. And the rest of the time, I'm just doing YouTube. But if you define work with something that you get paid for, yeah, then I'm working like 70 hours a week. <laughs> I'm working a lot, uh, but it's, it doesn't, it is not work for me because I love it so much. And, uh, and even if, if I, I get all the money of the world, I would not change a lot. Maybe I would hire someone to edit the videos and hire someone to do some of the work related to YouTube uh, that I don't enjoy the most. Uh, but it's also important for me that the thing is always mine. So I, I don't know if I even would hire someone because I really enjoy uh, crafting the video exactly yeah, the how I want it. Uh, and yeah. and like, uh, the tr I do always a trailer like 30, 40 seconds before the whole thing starts. And picking the interesting parts from the video and putting in like picking from a one hour uh, interview like 30 seconds that you highlight in front of the video uh, is also like a fun thing to do honestly and uh, right if oh yeah that's good luck dude. <laughs> yeah I, I have I have, I have, I have, I have, I have not process in me, uh, but the, the part that I wanted to do uh, make is like um, if you only work for money you're kind of a prostitute uh, to, to a certain extent, but it's okay in a temporary sense uh, if, we, yeah. it, if it serves a higher goal. Yeah. Uh, but long term, I would encourage everybody to find something you're good at, you love, and the world needs. And everybody has something. If it would be something different for everybody. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, 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 I'm really passionate about that also. Like uh, I'm most I'm, I'm mostly only talking about Bitcoin, but I enjoy talking with so many Bitcoiners because it also brings up different topics like that. It says like Ikiga has nothing to do with, with, with Bitcoin. Uh, 3D printing has uh, not a lot to do with Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's 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 fun to talk about that. You know, congratulations, crypto clips. I, I see you got the record order and you were literally making huge moves. I mean I'm proud of you, man. Like I am proud of you. Like I, I would, I would love to emulate some of your success, but that's on me to work hard to do that. And so I kudos to you. 
Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, um, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, for the for the end of the interview, um, I have one thing that I've seen in your your profile. It's your pin post. I always look at people's pin posts because it's 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 usually something important to them. Um, you pin something with an IRA trust. I did not understand it, uh, but I'm also not American. Like I also don't know what it's IRA and this 401k and stuff like that is. Uh, can you? Sure. Is it something that uh, that you want to share? And is is something important? Yeah, uh, so I some somebody put that put that somewhere in advice on like a daily uh, subreddit discussion thread at some point in the past a few years ago, and then it got deleted. And uh, like it was so, I thought it was so important because um, it was such good advice that I copied it and saved it there. And that's just that like the like as an American, like if you were interested, this is an ideal path. And Bill splits this right. So an IRA is an individual retirement account, right? It is a mechanism that you can use to either store pre-tax money that hasn't been taxed yet or post-tax money, which is a Roth IRA, right? And you can, uh, if you put post-tax money in there, it can grow to whatever size. And after, you know, you reach a certain age, you can just draw out from it. It doesn't matter because you already paid the tax on it. And that's the, the beauty of an IRA, right? Um, of a Roth IRA. A uh, regular IRA, it's you take your money from before earnings and you just throw it into this retirement account. So what this thing that I pasted that was showing you is showing you the legal means to do this, but with your Bitcoin, okay? And so what you can do is you can form a trust, like a trust LLC, right? That's not a you, it's a separate legal entity. And then you use this trust LLC to create its own exchange accounts, to have its own water, its own treasure, Right to have to be able to store the Bitcoin to be able on paper be to be able to show a distinct clear separation from your Bitcoin and this entity's Bitcoin. Understood? And so, therefore, you basically have this entity act as the um, what is it called? Like the power of attorney of your you know four K or of your IRA account, right? Pretty much, it is listed as like the substrate, the, the custodian of that IRA, right? Of the or that Roth IRA ideally, so that you don't have to be taxed on the gains, right? So you have it as this custodian of this Roth IRA, and then pretty much you transact with that account that only has that name, and that account is where you deposit your money. That's the whole you know that's designated for your Roth IRA or whatever to be to, to buy the bitcoins from the exchange under that name on that account, and then from that account you transfer that into the treasury that is also the property in custody of the trust, right? Um, and then therefore, legally, that Bitcoin is now tax-free. If you're doing it with a Roth IRA, like legally it's tax-free, do it with that way. It must be done in that specific way, in that specific order. It does not work if you already had prior, prior Bitcoin. Like whatever you did with the prior Bitcoin, you will still be like under the veil of the liability tax situation. So that that is why I, I post that there because that is... That's the advice. That's the room. Like that, you want, you want to, you want your free, free off ticket in the sunset. Like that is the way. And the way I know that this is legitimate is because if you read on it, the guy said he consulted it with his, you know, tax attorney, and this is what the tax attorney laid out. And so, I mean, yeah, like it's, it, I, and that's the reason why I think that's, it's really important. Like if you, uh, yeah, like if, you know, if you're otherwise, you can try to, you know, be like everybody else and just like, I'm going to hold on to it. I'll do the best I can. And I'll report the taxes. I need to report the tax, right? But you're going to have to be consistent and diligent with your records and show a costing basis and stick with that costing basis. I do it's going to be the whole first in, first out. Uh, I don't know. This is probably poor advice, but I would also tell somebody what you could do is you could um, start an RLC, right? And you have the LLC spend your Bitcoin, right? Into the expenses. And then the profitable gains off that you can offset that with the losses of, you know, like it's too much like defer and have it so that your company takes the losses and therefore it cancels out the payment that you have to pay on the capital gains, right? And so it kind of makes it a flat zero. I don't know if that really works well. I know there's going to have to be limits to that. You're not going to be able to spend like how you'd want to spend. And once you actually have profitable years, you're now cooking the books and that's legal. So don't do that, right? And so, um, I mean, but that's kind of, that, to me, that's sort of like, the quick and dirty way that probably the bulk we're going to do it. And so what I put in my pin tweet is the proper way you should do it to have a minimized tax liability. You want the tax liability to happen 
with the money. So you're spending the after tax money through the Roth into the Bitcoin. And therefore it's like now, you know, perfectly good. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, $600,000 a coin or $1 million a coin or $14 million a coin anymore. You don't pay Uncle Sam because you already did the taxes because it's now Roth. Absolutely. And then it's, uh, it's so important uh, to, even as uh, Bitcoiners are uh, often turned off by the system and they don't want to hear too much of the uh, usual system, it's so important to uh, investigate the system, to understand the system and get the best out of the system. You should not pay taxes when you don't have to pay taxes, but you should also not break the law because this will have uh, consequences on, on you individually. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, it's something I think, as I said, I think it's really important. Uh, it, a lot of people, so a lot of folks that are getting into Bitcoin, not everybody, but a lot of folks that have, don't have much to lose. And so once you're trying to look at the other side of it and you're trying to, if maybe you're trying to pay off your house or maybe you're trying to buy more homes and stuff, right? Like you now have something much more to lose. And so you need to be careful with what you're going to do and understand that the government is going to get paid. Like, they're going to figure it out. You're going to get audited. Something's going to happen down the line. So don't, don't do any fucker shit. Don't try to just, just, just do what you can and, and just run off to the sunset. Otherwise, you will rise. These are risks you're taking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, then let's let's now come to the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and uh, your question from the previous guest is, do you see any attacks coming on layer two free technologies uh, on top of Bitcoin that will try to capture Bitcoins? Absolutely. I certainly do. I most certainly do. Um, I can't even think of them yet, but well, no, they, they, are, they actually happen all the time. Dude. I mean, like rules, like uh, NFTs, uh, orbitals, uh, yeah, these are all attacks on Bitcoin. These are all like, Anything that acts as an affinity scam to like try to bedazzle you with value or show you that it's more important where it has a greater level of rarity, like it, like a rare sat, like it's all an attack on Bitcoin because it's meant to enrich and fuel you by exploding the stupidity of the mini, right? Um, and these are it's crazy. This is the lowest hanging fruit. If you really want to talk about real issues, let's talk about state actors, right? Like the government. The, all the governments, they have the, the eyes to look on us. They're, we have no idea how many people we transact with or how, how many different poles and lightning nodes exist that are already doing the tracking and like they already have their own virtual separate red listings that they don't work because it doesn't work at a protocol level, but they're able to already track and say, oh, see, this is why we think these eight or nine removed sets of transaction IDs are actually from Iran or actually from North Korea and we can show you how, you know? Like I'm scary because what's really happening is Perhaps they're actually trapping you, right? It's like you innocuously sent it to Coinbase, but they did it in such a way where they knew that they could send it and route it to other nodes that were not, you know, valid nodes, knowing that they were violating the law. They're doing it because they actually want to trap you as a Bitcoiner and they want to have you under their gun. You know, like this, you, I guarantee you this exists places now, but it's probably not happening in the bigger places, but it's a threat that will happen if it isn't like, if it doesn't already happen. Yeah, that's, uh, I, th I think there's a lot coming in the Bitcoin world. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, uh, yeah. there will be a lot coming. Like, even, even like, like, even kind of right now, I would say the biggest attack on Bitcoin is like the, the private sector in a way, right? Like, I mean, just intending to want to, like, you know, control it for their own or to be able to, like, root seek and have like a new kind of, a new form of rent seek. Right. That, that to me is an attack on Bitcoin. And yeah, so what I was mentioning earlier about Satoshi Nakamoto is, yeah, that I think for part of why I ended up being out was him seeing that, yeah, these are things that are going to happen. And I don't want, I don't want shit to do with this. And I'm getting old and I'm getting sick or I'm like, you know, or I have a daughter that I want to see grow up or like things like that. Or like my mom's dying, like things like that would have this person. So I'm cool. I need to just move on from Bitcoin. Yeah. So that's absolutely all right. Uh, <laughs> like we said, right? Bitcoin's not the most important thing. It's it's like the Dumbo feather. It shows you that you are the most important thing to you, and that you need to love your neighbor and show your neighbor that they need to love their neighbor. 
right? To me, I think that's that's the the real way. That's uh, the beautiful way to 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 kind of end the podcast. I usually ask where can people reach you and follow you, but we we already covered that that part in the middle of the episode. But just as a reminder, everything is uh, in the in the description, and they can find your links, uh, Frankenman, uh, in in the description and and find you there. Um, then yeah. Uh, Thank you uh, for, for being on and uh, for everyone uh, li listening and watching. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.